Michael and Taylor have the same rights as anyone else to have a relationship of any sort that they wish, uh, being consenting adults. Um, having a disability doesn't diminish their rights to that. For couples with disability living in Queensland, their situation can be a little different than other states. We have a criminal code that was written in the last century, century uh, that was made to protect people with intellectual impairment from predators, from coercion and from being taken advantage of. And this was done at a time when, for the most part, people with disability were living in institutions or were under um, protection in the family home. Um, for Taylor and Michael, this, if it was to be affected by the letter of the law, it could exclude them from having the relationship that they so rightly deserve to have. Uh, I doubt that the use of the letter of the law would be enforced in Queensland because they, their capacity to consent to have the relationship um, would be upheld, I believe, in our guardianship system. Um, the fact that uh, they have proceeded as far as they have in their relationship is testament to that. Um, so we do have good guardianship legislation in Queensland. It is merely that this criminal code uh, section could be used to um, exclude people from that or potentially could be used to exclude people from that, even though that's not what it was intended for. Um, there is a whole suite of legislation that I believe needs to be uh, amended in Queensland to um, allow people to enjoy and exercise the same rights that they have uh, as anyone else. Um, so it's not just merely this part of the criminal code, um, but certainly there, we don't want to see the intention removed from protecting people, especially if they are living in the care and control of people who are receiving government funds, whether that's hospitals, nursing homes, group homes or elsewhere. But when people are living in the community and they have, uh, or even if they're not, but if they've met people that they like, that they want to have a relationship with, then they should be supported to do that. So for example, um, the if there's a question about um, people, including Michael and Taylor's ability or capacity to give consent, it can be contested in QCAT, um, but there would be a doctor's examination and, and some questions answered uh, to determine that. Um, but we are moving away from only substitute decision making as a means to decide these things. Support for decision making is where uh, people who have an intellectual impairment uh, have conversations with their supporters who explain um, the issue at hand and uh, sometimes these conversations can be taken over um, a very long period of time. It could be over a, a lifetime really building a person's capacity to know their, uh, the world around them, um, the experiences that they have. Also, if people don't have opportunities and experiences to base their decisions on, that can limit uh, good decision making. So it is in the role of good supported decision making that can build people's capacity to make the decisions and that includes knowing about potential consequences um, if, if things should go wrong. So I certainly believe that um, amendments to our, um, our criminal code should be linked to things like our guardianship. The principles of our guardianship laws are very good but they are not very often um, practiced where uh, at times people just roll over or steamroll over people's rights to have support to make decisions. Under the rights of uh, the Convention of the Rights of People with Disability and indeed our own laws in Australia, people with disability like Michael and Taylor are certainly entitled to bodily integrity uh, and freedom to do with their bodies as they wish and that includes reproduction. Um, so there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do this. But of course, in practical terms, um, for people with intellectual impairment in Queensland and po possibly in other states, 
um, the state and the focus on the protection of the rights of the child can sometimes be overriding the rights of the parents. And while I don't necessarily agree with this, this is what does happen and, and people can have their children removed from them. And in fact, if you have an intellectual impairment, uh, or if both parents have an impairment uh, of intellectual uh, capacity, then quite often the children are removed the minute they're born, uh, which is a completely an outrage. Um, and without really looking into whether or not the couple have adequate supports, offering them supports if they need it, ensuring whether or not they're even have the capacity to be good parents. Um, but then again, we don't ask other parents in the community, are you good enough to raise your child? And this shouldn't be prejudging how a person with an intellectual impairment, uh, impairment pa uh, parents their children. If Michael and Taylor had children, um, it's quite likely that they could have their child removed at the moment it's born or some months down the track because um, the child's welfare could be perceived at, as being at risk. Um, ideally, this wouldn't be what happens. There would be an investigation into what informal supports the, the family had, uh, asking them if they needed help and offering them some supports. Certainly, um, they might be taking parenting classes during the pregnancy. Um, but these things often don't happen and quite often the parents spend a lot of time trying to get their children back. Uh, children are often placed in um, foster care where supports are offered and yet often it's not offered to the, the families themselves. I wouldn't like to say, um, mainly because as an advocacy organisation we don't hear the stories of families who this doesn't happen to. Uh, we only hear about the instances when it does and people are needing support and quite often we hear about it not uh, sometimes directly and sometimes indirectly through um, our colleagues and allies in other advocacy organisations uh, who work to um, help people stay together with their children. Um, so I, I really don't know how many families have managed to stay together and where this hasn't happened. I'm not an expert on the um, instance of Down syndrome. Um, I consider it to be a lucky dip and that uh, as a chromosomal um, change in a person's structure then this can happen to people um, but the likelihood of Michael and Taylor's ha having a child um, is probably more impacted upon by their level of fertility which may not be as high as uh, people who don't have Down syndrome but it doesn't mean to say that they wouldn't have a healthy child who doesn't have Down syndrome, I'm unaware of statistics of um, the birth rates um, of parents who both have Down syndrome. Yeah. People with disabilities like my Michael and Taylor aren't alone. Uh, there are people with Down syndrome in relationships all over the world. However, I do think that this is fairly new. When you consider that people with disabilities had been, until the last couple of decades, largely hidden from society, this is still fairly new. And the idea that two people with intellectual impairment should form a relationship, marry and have children, is fairly um, cutting edge. Although, I guess without having ever had segregation, um, there's probably been a time back in our history when this did happen naturally, but it was never recorded. Um, certainly I'm sure that there are um, online groups <laughs> who would love to communicate with Michael and Taylor and share their stories. Um, but yes, they probably are not, there probably aren't a lot of couples like them around, um, at, at least planning on parenthood. I certainly am aware of several couples who have Down syndrome who are very happy together. I don't know Michael or Taylor, so I can't tell you that. Like all people, people with intellectual impairment are all different. And our range of capabilities and um, reasoning powers all vary just like anyone else. Our ability to consent to a sexual relationship or intimate relationship is dependent on the individual. Uh, it is also dependent on the 
life history that they've had. Uh, for, certainly for somebody who has an intellectual impairment, who has spent their entire life in an institution, who hasn't been given any sexual edu and relationship education, who hasn't been exposed to the broader community and people without disability, then that ability to give consent is severely inhibited by those lack of opportunities and um, experiences. But for people who have been um, out in the wider world, who have been exposed to a range of relationships, let's face it, we all have friendships, we have colleagues, we have neighbours, they're all relationships of different types. And we learn how to uh, behave accordingly in each different relationship type. So. For Michael and Taylor and other people out there in the community who've had those experiences, then it's quite likely that they do have the capacity, but I don't know them well enough to say that whether or not they do. As a parent of a young woman with a disability myself, I fully appreciate that sometimes rights and uh, responsibilities don't always match up or don't appear to match up with what's going on in the real world. However, it's not so much about whether or not this is possible or practical. It's about what we do in putting in supports around people um, to make it work. And certainly I understand that from um, the parent's perspective, this could be quite uh, an ordeal. So therefore it is probably best that they give Michael and Taylor opportunities to meet with other parents who've got young children, see what experience, what it's like to be with a young child day in and day out, whether or not they even want that once they've had a weekend away with a, a say a, a, a relative's um, young child or baby or what have you. Uh, going and visiting ch sick children in hospitals may be a way to see what it's like and, and how difficult it might be to look after a child who's unwell. but. We don't have that when we go into parenting ourselves and, and no one offers us a manual. So why should we have higher expectations of these young parents than we do of anyone else? Um, it's not that they should pass the test situation. It's about how do we make it work for them? Having a happy future, Having a happy future uh, in a relationship is difficult for everyone. And for the families of Michael and Taylor, then it's important to make sure that, that they have young people around them who don't have disabilities, who have capacity to make sure that their relationship is secure, that if they do have a family, they have people who can help them. And succession planning for the parents is really important. And, and while that may involve siblings, sometimes siblings don't want to be the pseudo parent either. That's why it's no one person's role or job. Ideally, having the widest circle of friends that you can possibly make happen for anyone makes a rich and rewarding experience. And it also means then that people engage because they want to and they do it as and when and as much as they can. And, it, and sometimes that might mean assigning small roles to a bunch of people who can come in and help or just be there or be guidance to this young couple for the rest of their lives if they need it. And it's quite likely that as they travel through their, their journey on this, this exciting time ahead of them, that they will have less and less dependency on those supports. Michael and Taylor's parents have done an absolutely fantastic job in raising their children and making them have faith in themselves and belief that they can do whatever they want to do. And I completely concur and I understand as a parent myself. And it is really hurtful at times to know and see when your child tries to attain a goal and that they fail and, be dis and can be disappointed. But that's part of growing up and it's part of life. And while I am completely empathetic with their fears that these parents may have for the future of the, this young couple and the children that they may have, uh, if we continued to balk at everything we were fearful of, would they have ever let their children out the door in the first place? And my advice to them is that the, the couple may try to have children and they may not. 
they may have a child and they may find that it's very, very difficult to raise them. So it's about rallying the troops now and it's about making sure that they have those supports. And if it doesn't happen and disappointment is one of the things that they experience, then that is a life learning experience for them as well. And they will learn to cope. And I think that the parents have had faith in their children this far to cope with life so far that they can have faith that they will cope with the disappointment if it does happen. Michael and Taylor are adults and they have the right to have a relationship of their choosing just like anyone else. Uh, the fact that they have Down syndrome does not diminish their rights to a relationship. Um, the parents do have, uh, the parents of Michael and Taylor do have avenues that they could pursue to prevent them from having um, relationship or to prevent them from having children however they are very severe and they are not in keeping from my understanding of their journey with their children so far as they could perhaps appeal to QCAT um, for a guardianship order which would mean that they would override everything that they've built up in their children in their lives so far they have so far supported them to make decisions by applying for guardianship, they would be basically taking all of that from them. Um, they could perhaps attempt to secure uh, an order for sterilization, which is really um, something completely abhorrent to most of us uh, because it is interfering with the bodily integrity of people. Um, I would say that they would have no chance of winning that. Um, they would essentially have to break up the relationship for it to be successful at, by having a guardianship order. Um, and I think that would be devastating. And then the after effects of that would, could be so potentially damaging to both their children. Um, it is a very severe consequence. Um, and sterilization is something that the law states it must be because of a medical matter that is of extreme urgency. Um, it's not the old bad old days when sterilization was wrongly used for management of menstruation uh, or that it was a means of preventing uh, pregnancy because after all um, that, that was done as a means of uh, protecting the person from an unwanted pregnancy after a rape. Now, this is no nothing like that. This is not those kinds of circumstances. Um, and sterilization, while it is still performed, it is thankfully in fewer and fewer instances. Mind you, we are aware that people are still seeking this and that some doctors are still doing it um, and they are not reporting those procedures accurately to cover up for what they've done. And so often the person themselves has been completely unaware of what's happened to them. The parents could apply to the court seeking an order for guardianship to remove um, potential for the relationship for Michael and Taylor. However, it's likely it wouldn't be successful because I do believe they would be deemed to have capacity, so therefore it would fail.